Thank you for joining me again today. Please be taking your Bibles, uh, if you have them handy, and turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. We're actually going to begin where we left off last week. We left off with verse 17, which I believe is the key verse of the entire pa uh, passage. And uh, so it, it is the theme verse of the book of 1 Peter. And in verse 17, it says, It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And what that simply means is, we can even take another phrase in, that's been quoted time and time again throughout the scriptures, uh, that it rains on the just and on the unjust. So if you're going to suffer in life anyway, the whole context of this means that it is better to suffer according to the will of God rather than to suffer outside of the will of God. Well, that makes all of the sense in the world. To, uh, if we're going to suffer, suffer with the one who can take us through it. Suffer with the one who can give us comfort. And then we're going to find in today's lesson that we're going to move on and uh, talk about an Old Testament story. And Peter, whenever he wrote this passage of Scripture, I'm sure he had no idea that it would be one of the most debated uh, and questioned passages of Scripture in the New Testament. And uh, we'll look at that in just a few moments. Personally, I don't think it's that difficult, other than the fact that there are some resources that you have to use and uh, some terms and definitions that you have to know from that era and from that age uh, that help give answer to some of the questions that come from the average Bible reader. So I would like to give strong credit uh, to some of my college professors who uh, kind of ironed some of this out or helped point me uh, in the right direction regarding this, this particular passage of Scripture. Let's just read it. It's just about six verses or so. Uh, in verse 18, it says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now that's the confusing part. Who were those spirits in prison? Who disobeyed long ago when God patiently in the days of Noah, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers, all in submission to him. So I, I want you to think about uh, uh, this passage of Scripture. What was Peter trying to say here? And uh, he begins by telling us in verse 17, as I've already read, it's better to suffer according to the will of God. And then it's as if he says, look at Jesus, for example. You know, and, and maybe Peter was inferring, go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was there that Jesus said, Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. So Jesus was talking to his heavenly Father. He was talking to God while in his flesh, and in his flesh, Jesus did not want to go to the cross. In his flesh, he did not want to feel the whips come down on his back whenever they would beat him. In his flesh, he did not want to feel the uh, uh, nails piercing through his hands. In his flesh, he did not want to feel the pain and the humiliation of hanging on that cross. Uh, he did not want to feel the sun beating down on him. He did not want to see the buzzards flying overhead. 
uh, in his flesh, he didn't want to have to go through all of that. And so Peter points us to Jesus, and uh, he said, Jesus suffered for doing good. Jesus suffered. He, he didn't die for any sins of his own, but he took this journey not only for us, but he took this journey because it was his Heavenly Father's will. It was God the Father's will for him to do this. And he died for the sins of mankind once and for all. I want to remind you that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. He would offer a sacrifice while he was there for the sins of the nation of Israel. And, uh, and so he would do that once, uh, once a year. But whenever Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice was sufficient for every sin that mankind would have ever committed. Now, in just a moment, he's going to point us to the story of Noah. And uh, what was it that caused that great judgment? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, I think about verse 4, it says there that every thought, every imagination was evil continuously. So there was not a moment that there, was, uh, that there wasn't an evil, uh, contentious thought. It, there wasn't a moment that their imaginations uh, did not run wild with them. And so because that sin was so rampant in the world at that time, and because that sin was so rampant in the hearts and the minds of people in that generation, God took action and he destroyed the world with a flood. But we're here to remember that Jesus died for the sins of of all mankind. He died for Adam and Eve's sin. And there was even a prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, teaching us that uh, through the redemptive work on, of Jesus Christ, that one day that ser serpent that tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, or in other words, one day Satan who tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, that even though he may bite the heel of, of, of Jesus and caused Jesus the pain of going to the cross. In the end, Jesus, through his power over sin and death, whenever he would rise again at the resurrection, he would crush the head of Satan. So in other words, his power crushed all of the evil power that Satan had hoped to accomplish. That's actually the first prophecy printed in, uh, in, in Scripture. We get to Genesis, we only get to chapter 3, and already whenever we see Adam and Eve's sin and we see God's method of forgiveness whenever he sacrifices a, uh, an animal for them, and, uh, and then he said, he gives them the prophecy that one day someone would come and he would literally crush uh, the power of Satan. And so all of this that Peter is writing here, it actually refers back to some of those verses. So notice this. It says that Jesus was put to death in the body, but they couldn't keep him down. He was made alive by the Spirit. So because he was God's Son, because he was Emmanuel, God with us, because he was God in the flesh. I want you to notice something. Whenever uh, Jesus was, uh, was on the cross and he felt that physical body about to die, and, and uh, a different gospel's uh, uh, point, which one he said last, but but we know that he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, or I'm giving you back my spirit. And then another time he said, it is finished. So, so I want you to notice that even though they could silence that physical body, Jesus never in a moment ceased to exist. Because it goes on to say, that uh, he was put to death in the body and made alive by the Spirit. Now notice this. 
they're saying that we understand that, that we are going to be made alive by the Spirit after we die if we are in Christ Jesus. But notice the significance of what's being said here uh, in verse number 19. It says, He was made alive by the Spirit, and because of this, He went and preached to the spirits who were in heaven. Those who had disobeyed God long ago. And, and then it references the days of Noah. Why was the days of Noah uh, represented in this way? Well, a, a variety of reasons. Uh, he's going to end up comparing the ark floating on the water as an act of baptism. And, and we're going to see a symbol there. But one of the reasons why he may have gone to them first was uh, perhaps this was the most evil-minded generation who had ever lived. And I, I am sure that for there to be so much evil-mindedness, it, it, it meant that uh, there were a lot of lost souls awaiting judgment. Now, it says there that, that uh, he went to the spirits in prison. Now, I, I want to talk about that in prison just a little bit, and uh, and I have a reference book that I think, think helps quite a bit. Now, Peter doesn't define it by calling it hell, uh, and uh, but, but the interesting thing is it has been taught that Jesus went to the bowels of hell. And for whatever reason, lots of times, because that's the way we define it, we picture Jesus in Gehenna. Uh, in other words, the lake of fire. Whenever it says that Jesus went to hell uh, uh, while he was awaiting the resurrection. Uh, that was not the case at all. There were several words that, that referenced uh, uh, the word that is used in, uh, in the Bible for hell in many cases uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it references the type of situation that they were looking at. And uh, uh, in the Old Testament, the word Sheol was used. And in the New Testament, if you have a modern translation, you'll read the word Hades quite a bit. And, uh, and I've even preached about this in one of my sermons since I've been here. But... Um, Hades and Sheol, uh, it's the same place, same thing. Uh, uh, Sheol is the Hebrew name for it. Hades is the Greek name for it. Uh, Gehenna is uh, anytime you read anything about the eternal punishment or the lake of fire, uh, that is referencing Gehenna, and sometimes hell is used there as well. Uh, almost all Bible scholars, almost all of them, even the conservative Bible scholars, most of them agree that uh, uh, those who were translating the King James Version shouldn't have used the literal word hell as often as they should have. They should have differentiated. And, and in the Old Testament, lots of times we read the word Sheol, but uh, in the New Testament, uh, in the King James Version, you do not see the word Hades, only in the more modern translations. So let me give you a definition of Hades, and, uh, and I want you to see how it differs from the description of the lake of fire. Hades is the region of departed spirits of the lost. So in other words, those who are awaiting judgment. But then it says also that it will be the uh, region of the blessed dead in periods preceding the ascension of Christ. And, and so it's been thought by some that uh, it just means the place of the unseen, but it's the place where one goes whenever they are awaiting judgment. So what was Jesus doing when he was preaching? Was he preaching to the host of Satan, letting them know that judgment was waiting for them? Or was he on some sort of evangelistic crusade? Uh, uh, none of us really, really know. 
but Bible scholars all agree that, that the fact that the word Hades is not used uh, uh, in the uh, King James Version of the translations, that that was a mistake by those, by those translators. Um, and so an interesting thing about um, uh, Hades is just talking about those who are awaiting their judgment. So whenever it says that Jesus went to hell, or, or Bible teachers teach that, uh, it would be more correct to say that Jesus went to Hades and preached to those who were awaiting judgment. So I, I want you to notice that. And so they disobeyed long ago uh, when God had patiently waited. Now how long did God wait in the days of Noah? The Bible says Noah preached for 120 years and uh, we don't see the evidence of any converts, just only his family, only eight, only the eight that were in his family. Uh, he and his wife, his three sons, and their wives. So 120 years of preaching and no hope for a revival in that day and in that generation. So it goes on to say then in verse 20 that eight and all were saved by water. And now all of a sudden, Peter takes this sidestep and starts talking about baptism. Now, I want you to notice something. In the days of Noah, Noah gathered the animals on the ark, and then he went and got inside of the ark, and God shut the door, and then it rained. The floods consumed the earth, and Noah and his family were carried safe from the earth through the water. In baptism, we are carried symbolically safe from the earth to the Spirit. We are putting to death our sins, and we are burying them, and we are rising again to new life in the Spirit. Uh, I shared in our baptismal service, uh, uh, you either saw it uh, perhaps last Sunday as we showed the video of it, or maybe you even saw it live two weeks ago, uh, but I had made the uh, statement that uh, many people teach uh, children that whenever they're about to be baptized that the baptism uh, is washing away their sins. And, uh, and so I made the statement that uh, it's like saying that you live in Posey County, but you want me to just find your house and know how to find it. Uh, you know, I'm going to need more than that. So, so to say that baptism is the washing away of your sins, that's like saying, hey, I live in Posey County. Come over and see me. Uh, so, so I want you to notice something here. Peter refutes that type of ideology. Notice it says that... Uh, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from your body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. So uh, evidently Peter had to deal with that too as he was baptizing people. Uh, Peter had to say, no, no, it's not really the washing away of your sins. Instead, it is being saved through the water, and he gives the comparison of Noah. Or in our case, uh, whenever somebody comes to the end of their life and they die, they are placed in the ground, and if that person is a believer in Jesus Christ, they will rise again uh, one day. They'll have a new body. They'll rise again, and forever, First Thessalonians says, forever they will be with the Lord. And, and so we also know that whenever uh, I baptize somebody, it's a testimony from that person saying, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus was buried under the ground with my sins. I believe Jesus rose again on the third day on that Easter morning without my sins, and he was the first fruit to, uh, to resurrect and I will follow that example because I am a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. I will be placed in the ground at the end of my life, and at the appropriate time, I too will rise again. 
victorious over the sins of my flesh, and I'll be alive again in the Spirit. So, so how encouraging is that just to realize all that God uh, has done for us and all that God, all of the efforts that he has done uh, to save us. So uh, in our baptism, it means that uh, uh, whenever we're baptized, that we are symbolically making a clean break from our past. So the flood, um, Noah and his family, whenever they were on that ark, everyone else was destroyed. Noah and his family were making a clean break from their past. The flood, like baptism, pictures death. It pictures burial. It pictures uh, resurrection. And, uh, and so Noah and his family were uh, resurrected or brought up on Mount Ararat to safety. Now, I, I want us to look, I'm going to close with one special thing today, but uh, it goes on to say that baptism is the answer of a good conscience uh, uh, toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is now at the right hand of God. So Jesus has been restored to his appropriate place. He went, he accomplished the thing that the Heavenly Father sent him to do. And as a result of that, uh, Peter echoes some of the statements of Paul. Uh, remember Paul in uh, Philippians 2. Uh, he says he's given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Peter says it a little bit differently. Jesus has gone into heaven. He's back at the right hand of God. And now angels, authorities, and all powers are now subject to him. So everyone answers to Jesus. Now, uh, one of the things that really helps me in my walk with Jesus Christ. It helps authenticate uh, my faith. It helps to prove Christ in my life over and over and over again is various things that God chose to do. Um, things in the calendar. Um, the fact that he used 40 different writers to write the Bible spanning a period of about uh, 3,500 years and they all had to fit the pieces of the puzzle together. And, and uh, they didn't have all of those pieces of the puzzle. It was only through listening to the direction of the Holy Spirit that we have a completed work of the scriptures that uh, correctly teaches us the doctrine of God and the hope of all humanity. So, and, and again, it, I find it amazing that uh, even though they didn't mean to do this, I find it amazing, for example, that uh, Jesus was arrested on, uh, on Passover and he was executed before Passover was completed. And so, you know, coincidence? No. You know, and, uh, and if the religious leaders of the day would have known that uh, uh, they were fulfilling Passover from God's point of view, uh, they would not. They would have waited to another day to have crucified Jesus. They would not have crucified him on that particular day. And they already had the celebration of first fruits that was planned uh, three days later. And what happens on that third day? Uh, Jesus rose again from the dead, and and instead of the celebration of first fruits. We call it uh, either Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. But uh, he was the first fruits, and the Apostle Paul acknowledges that in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, whenever he said that Jesus is the first fruits of those who were once asleep, meaning those who had died but came back to life. Jesus is the first one to rise again, and those who trust him and believe in him will follow his example. So I love those evidences of the Bible that, that authenticate everything. Now, uh, I'm going to close with one thing. I may have to read most of it to you, but uh, this is just another thing that just authenticates uh, God's plan in this world. It may be worth noting that the chronolog uh, uh, chronology 
of the flood is closely related to the Lord's day at the resurrection. So, in other words, it fits with the calendar. Notice this. Noah's ark, the Bible says, Noah's ark rested on Mount Ararat on the 17th day of the 7th month. Now notice, okay? Now, uh, uh, their months were a line different than ours. January was not the first month. July was not the 7th month. But I want you to notice that under the Jewish calendar, uh, that Noah's ark rested on Mount Ararat on the 17th day of the 7th month. That's in Genesis 8-4. The Jewish civil year started with October. The religious year started with Passover in April. But that was not instituted until Moses' time. So what's the 7th month from October? The 7th month from October is April. Our Lord was crucified on the 14th day of that month, Passover. And he rose again after third day, on the third day. He resurrected on the third day. That takes us to the 17th day that the stone was rolled away. And so it so closely ties in with even the story of Noah and it fits the calendar why would God do that? To authenticate in our hearts and in our minds that all of this is true. Thank you for joining me today. Now, next Wednesday, I'm going to do something different. And uh, if you go to the website uh, uh, to get the devotion for the day, I don't know how they will mark it, but I hope they will mark it Christmas, Christmas in some way or another. I'm going to share with you uh, some of the Old Testament prophecies and point out their fulfillment. And so we're going to do a, uh, a Bible study on December 23rd that talks about uh, the fulfillment that Jesus brought to those Old Testament prophecies. Thank you for taking this time to study the Bible with me. God bless you.